Welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here with us today. My name is Sheila and I'll be your host for this online worship experience. If this is your first time joining us, we wanna give you a very special welcome. We'd appreciate it if you'd check in with us and give us your name and an email address. And this coming week, we'll send you a coupon for coffee on us. This is week one of our sermon series on Moses. Pastor Spencer has a great message just ahead for all of us. And speaking of that message, you'll find sermon discussion questions and more online at schweitzer.church slash next. And now, here's Stella with our announcements. Hey y'all, I'm Stella Green and welcome to Schweitzer. Summer is here. And did you know that we have tons of ways to still stay connected all summer long? Each Sunday, we'll have classes at both 9 and 10.30 a.m. for all ages. There's also a new women's Bible study called Women of Worth that will begin this Thursday, May 30th at 6.15 in the Prayer Garden. Learn more about these opportunities at the Blue Booth or at schweitzer.church groups. Looking ahead to June, we do have a few important things for you to mark on your calendars. Second season for folks 50 and older, so not me, will meet at 1130 on June 6th. And then on June 26th, we'll have a church-wide hymn sing for all ages. And lastly, our Schweitzer night at the Springfield Cardinals on Friday, June 28th. You can learn about all of these on our website or at the Blue Booth today. There's always a lot happening around the Schweitzer campus. So one way you can stay connected is by signing up for our e-news. You can do this by signing up today on the homepage of our website, schweitzer.church. We'd also love for you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, so you can keep up with the latest news happening around here. And now on this beautiful day, let's continue with worship. That was a really aggressive head, Bob. <laughs> It's like, let's continue with worship. Okay. And now on this beautiful day, let's continue with worship. Thanks Stella for those great announcements. If you're worshiping with us live today, we invite you to join in the chat and say hello to your friends or give us your insights. And if you find yourself in need of prayer, we have someone waiting for you right now in our prayer room. Just press that button and we'll be right with you. And now let's continue in worship.
As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to join me as we pray together. Holy God, we praise you today. It is our joy to be a part of worship and, and a part of serving you and, and sharing your good news with others. And God, we thank you for the recent sunshine and the recent rains because we know that both of those things together make us grow. They make the flowers grow and, and we love your creation and your beauty. But God, just like that in our lives, there are days that are full of sunshine and positive things. And then there are times in our lives that are full of rain and sorrow and difficulties. But God, we put our trust in you. We are not in this alone. And we know that you are in control and you are faithful through all things. So God, help us to just let go and let you take charge of our lives. Help us to share that joy of being faithful with you with other people. And God, as we continue in prayer today, we wanna to pray that prayer that your son gave to us, saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to this time of offering, I wanna share with you about two great groups that you might not know about in our Schweitzer Ministries. The Joy Pickers and the Senior Saints are two ensembles that go out into our community and share their music. The Joy Pickers play stringed instruments. The Senior Saints are a wonderful choir of folks and they share this beautiful music with people in our community. This spring, they have done 17 performances for care facilities and, and different programs around the community. These ministries and so many others happen because of your kindness and your generosity. I wanna remind you that you can give online at schweitzer.church slash give. And now, here's Pastor Spencer with our message, week one of Moses. Friends, welcome today. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Spencer. Uh, today we are starting a, a journey all summer long, Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend. That's 15 weeks. We're going to be walking through the story of Moses. So why Moses? Well, beyond him being just like one of the most important people who's ever lived, his influence is still largely felt in the world today. I mean, you think about the Ten Commandments are like a bedrock of Western civilization. But the story of Moses in the Bible, this is not a story of just a historical figure. We're not reading this for facts and figures and just to gain information like it's a biography as if we were studying someone like George Washington. No, 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 no. The story of Moses is the story of salvation. This is also why the story of Moses is not just another moral tale. I, I, I don't want you to walk away from these, these uh, messages thinking to yourself, okay, 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 this week I'm gonna really try to be more like Moses because that's to really, really, really miss the point. The story of Moses is the story of salvation. It's the story of how God has come to do for his people what, what they couldn't do for themselves. And so as we walk through the story of Moses, we are just going to see week after week after week the salvation of God at work in his people. And because the story of Moses is the story of salvation, week after week after week, we're also going to see how this story is pointing to someone else. Because the story of salvation is really the story of Jesus. 
Now, as we get into this, we're going to cover a ton of ground today. We're going to meet Moses. We're going to set this up. Uh, we're going to cover two chapters, Exodus 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to follow along with us as we walk through this. Um, and so let's jump into this because we're going to cover just a ton of ground today. So Exodus um, starts like this. The, the, the second book of the Bible, it opens with the sons of Jacob um, coming to live in Egypt from the promised land. Uh, the sons of Jacob are also known as Israel. Jacob was renamed Israel. And so they come to live in Egypt because a great famine has hit the land and they come to Egypt hoping to find food. Well, while they are in Egypt and end up staying in Egypt, we read this, chapter one, verse seven. It says, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. By the way, does that sound familiar? It, it should. It should remind you of the very first chapter of the Bible when God created people, right? God made them male and female. He created them in his image and likeness. That's what we read in Genesis 1. And then he gave them the very first command. Do you know what the very first command to people was? It was be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. This is what the people of Israel, the sons of Jacob, the family of Jacob is doing. They're fruitful and they are multiplying. Um, as they do this, this is a threat to the Egyptians because they see this outside culture, this outside nation, not assimilating into the Egyptian way of life. And so this is threatening to them. And so we read um, this in verse 11. So the Egyptians put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. That's really important. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly, but that's not all they did. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the on the delivery stool. If you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. This act of genocide is an act of cultural genocide. The idea here is that if the girls grow up, they'll be married off to other people, other nations. The boys will be killed. Thus, you create a docile slave population. We keep going here. Verse 17, the midwives, however, feared God and they did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Verse 20, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And so the story of Moses begins here in the midst of oppression and pain and suffering and struggle and slavery and injustice and genocide. We come now to Exodus 2, verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying. And she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. That's what the name Moses means to draw out. And it's noted that it's a, it's an Egyptian name, not a Hebrew name. And so Moses, he lives in the court of Pharaoh as the grandson of Pharaoh. This Hebrew boy with an Egyptian name, growing and learning, being educated and taught in the court of Pharaoh, learning the ways of the Egyptians. Verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, so years now have passed, he went out to where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. 
He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Interesting that we just read that phrase twice, own people. It's like, it's like Exodus is like, hey, 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 don't forget who Moses really is. I know he, he looks like an Egyptian. He has the name of an Egyptian. He has the dress of an Egyptian, the speech of an Egyptian, the look of an Egyptian, the family of an Egyptian, the education of an Egyptian, but that's not who he really is. It's just right now he doesn't know who he really is, which I bet that's a point that comes back up in several times in this sermon series over the summer. Verse 12, looking this way and that and seeing no one, so fully aware of what he's about to do, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. What an impulsive, stupid thing to do. And again, here's something else I bet we talk about several more times in the series is this impulsiveness of, of an anger of Moses. In fact, this will eventually be what keeps him out of the promised land, this impulsiveness and anger in his life. But verse 13, that's for years from now. Um, we'll get to that sometime in August. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid, and he thought, what I did must have become known. His own people now turn against him. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water. Again, that's the name of Moses, right? To be drawn out. To draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. I wonder what that means, he came to their rescue. I, I bet it means he fought them, right? I mean, again, here's Moses fighting. He, he leads with his fist. Well, the girls run off. They go tell their father about what happened and listen to how they describe Moses to their father. Verse 19, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us um, and watered the flock. Isn't it interesting that they confuse Moses with an Egyptian? Especially as Moses is trying to figure out like where he belongs. He's born a slave. He's raised a prince. He gets in trouble fighting for his own people. And even though he doesn't share in their slavery, um, now he's confused with being Egyptian. It's like, who is this guy? Um, while he doesn't really know where he belongs, he does find a new family in this uh, family from Midian. And so verse 21, Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And I think this is what you call irony because it's like, Moses, hold on, what are you talking about? All the time while you were in Egypt, you were also a foreigner. It's just you didn't know it because you were confused about who you really are. And then we come to the end of the chapter, chapter two, verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now, as I said at the beginning, the story of Moses is not just the story about a great man who does great things and that we should try to now be more like him. This is the story of salvation. Even though it doesn't look like it right now. I mean, these first two chapters of Exodus, things go just continually from bad to worse. I mean, let's just chart through the chapter it real quick so we can see this. I mean, there's just thing after thing after thing goes from bad to worse. So we think about it. The sons of Jacob, the Hebrews, they're free, but they had to travel from a famine. So there's bad things. Um, but because they multiply, they are a threat to the Egyptians. And so they are enslaved, but they continue to multiply. So their enslavement leads to genocide. Now this genocide is, is terrible for them. And and eventually a, a person is born who it looks like is going to be the hero, except that this person who's born who's going to be the hero is impulsive and angry and can't control himself. And, and now this person who should have had all the political power and access to Pharaoh, he's an impulsive idiot, so he gets run out of town. And so the hero is out of the picture. And it's just like things go from bad to worse over and over and over again. And if you read through this, it also appears like God is absent. 
I mean, as we read through these two chapters and things are getting worse and worse and worse, there is very little mention of God in these first two chapters. In fact, in these two chapters, there are only two things that are attributed to God in these first two chapters. One is that the Hebrew midwives are um, are blessed by God through his kindness to have children. And two, at the very end of the chapter, God hears the groaning and he looks upon the people of Israel and is concerned about them. But as everything goes from bad to worse, so there's virtually no mention of God in Exodus 1 and 2, except for those two instances. And that is very much on purpose. I mean, this is like an incredible commentary about what it's like when life goes from bad to worse. I mean, when life gets out of control, all of us, doesn't matter who you are, all of us start to ask the question, where is God? Why is God not moving in my life? Why is not God doing something? This is like a brilliant commentary about what that feels like. The storms of life start brewing. Life gets out of control. We don't see God moving. And we usually come to one of three conclusions about what God must be doing. We think either that God is absent, we think that God is uncaring, or three, we think that God is unable to save us. But because Moses is the story of salvation, and um, we, we catch that that Exodus is actually, what it's doing is subverting that idea. And it's showing us just how false that kind of thinking is, that God is absent, uncaring, or unable to save. Because while God is not explicitly mentioned in these first two chapters, his hand is clearly seen in every moment along the way. I mean, again, let's chart it. So let's think about this. First of all, we see God subverting Pharaoh in pretty much everything Pharaoh does. But it's not just that the things that Pharaoh plans backfire on him. It's that God uses what Pharaoh intends for evil. God uses it for good and for his purposes. And so we think about it. Pharaoh, his evil intention, he enslaves the Israelites. But during their enslavement, the Israelites are fruitful and they continue to multiply. They live into the command of Genesis 1. And then Pharaoh declares the genocide. And uh, the people he put in charge of the genocide, these midwives, they uh, subvert his intentions by their act of civil disobedience. This leads to Pharaoh making the genocide broader. So it's not just the midwives who should kill the babies. Everyone should kill the babies, throw them into the Nile River, which is actually what Moses' mother does. You know, she, she puts him in a basket in the Nile River, which, by the way, that word basket that she puts him in in the original Hebrew is only used in one other instance in the Bible. It's the only other time that it's used in the Bible is to describe the boat that Noah builds that saves him and his family from the floodwaters. And so by using that word, you know, Exodus is like, hey, this is not just another act of maternal care. This is like, no, 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 wink, wink, nudge, nudge. God is at work here. He is saving even if you can't see it. And then this child is adopted by the Egyptians and he receives the best training in the world and he gains access to Pharaoh that will later be very, very beneficial. And then you think about it, Moses' mother, she's the one who's brought to, to nurse Moses, being able to do the very thing that she wants most to do in this world. And then even after Moses is incredibly stupid and impulsive and gets run out of town, he ends up at a well. I mean, again, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. How many times is water going to be something that God uses in a mighty way to bring salvation in Moses' life. I mean, it's just like time after time after time after time, God's hand is at work. So God may not be mentioned, but he is all over the place. Now, the thing is, we can see that, but if you were living in these, in these moments, you would never be able to see it. Because these two chapters don't cover a period of days or weeks or months or even years, they cover centuries. I mean, Moses' own story in Exodus 2 covers decades. And this is the thing about God's faithfulness in the Bible, is that it is so hard for us to understand how slow God's faithfulness is sometimes expressed, especially in our instant culture. I mean, life gets hard, and we expect God to move like yesterday. (laughs) But this immediate gratification that we live in, this, this, this uh, immediate culture that we live in, it, it shapes us to have these false expectations about what God's faithfulness looks like and how we 
live into it. And we expect things to be fast, but in the Bible, this is not how God's faithfulness operates. I mean, God's faithfulness in the Bible is not measured in, you know, minutes and hours or days or even months or years. God's faithfulness in the Bible is measured in decades and even generations. I mean, the truth is, it's very possible that you are praying for things that you may never see, but your grandchildren might. God's faithfulness is the slow work of salvation. But this is sometimes what makes God's faithfulness and salvation so hard for us to grasp because in our small, limited view, it doesn't look like God is moving because we face difficult circumstances. Things go from bad to worse. And we conclude that God must be uncaring or unable or absent. And so many people walk away from faith because of that point. But I just got to be blunt with you. If God's faithfulness is dependent on our perspective, that's just arrogant. And I think it's because of this need to think about God's faithfulness much larger than our own perspective that one of the commands you see over and over and over and over in the Bible is to remember. I mean, let me give you some examples here. Exodus 17, the Lord says this to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Like, write this down. Don't, don't forget this. That's why people journals, like, write this down, put pen to paper and remember what it is that I've done, what I'm saying. Um, Deuteronomy 4, Moses says this to the people of Israel as they're preparing to enter into the promised land. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 5, again, as they prepare to enter the promised land, Moses says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Or Psalm 42, I love this one. My soul is downcast within me. So like, I feel overwhelmed. What do I do when I feel overwhelmed? What do I do when the anxiety is spiking? What do I do when I feel depressed? What do I do when I feel like I'm drowning? What do I do? Okay, here's what I do. Therefore, because I feel downcast, because I'm overwhelmed, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan. Or Psalm 63, on my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. I love this. In my sleeplessness and my tossing and turning, I don't spend those nighttime hours worrying about all the what ifs. No, 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 no. I spend my time remembering. Or maybe the most famous example, because there's so many of these in the Bible, over and over and over again, you see this command to remember. But maybe the most famous example of, of this command is when Jesus takes the bread and the wine and he tells his disciples to eat and drink this. And then he tells them he, they need to do this, quote, do this in remembrance of me. So why would the Bible have such an ex emphasis on remembering? Well, it's because our perspective is so severely limited. I mean, if, if our perspective is all that we're depending on, we are going to end up losing faith. It's just simple. So the Bible says over and over and over again, you got to remember, you got to remember. One of the practical ways we remember is that we read and we study the Bible. We read and study the story of Moses and we remember like, you know, I wasn't there in Egypt, but when I read this story, I remember reminded that the same God who saved Moses and the people of Israel is the same God who is saving me. And so as I read this story of, of, of Moses and the people of Israel, and I see these things going from bad to worse, I then can look at my own life and remember, you know what? God does all kinds of things, sometimes in the background that I can't even see. And when it all seems lost, and it seems that maybe God has given up on me or God isn't, isn't there, but in reality, he's working salvation. And so I, re I read these stories and, and I remember, because just because I can't see him moving, it doesn't mean that he's not. Things may seem lost, but but that's also when God is at work and so I don't lose hope because I remember. I remember, I remember, I remember the subtle, slow, hidden ways of God's salvation. Now, to put another layer on this, because it's not just that we have such a limited perspective, it's also that God saves us in such unpredictable ways. Again, let's go back to the story and let's put another layer on here. And I want you to notice the people that God uses to bring his salvation and to show his faithfulness. Because in these first two chapters, the heroes that God calls and that they respond and the heroes of the story that, that does show up each time are all women. Most of them are slave women. Let's chart through it. First, we have the two midwives. 
Now, in that culture, in that day and age, day and age, you don't become a, a midwife because it's a vocational choice. You become a midwife because you are childless. This is something that was kind of assigned to you. And because you're childless, you are considered to be cursed. So these first two midwives, it's not just that they're women, it's that they're slave women. It's not just that they're slave women, is that they are cursed slave women. And then uh, these cursed slave women, this is so incredible, are named Shipra and Pua. Great names, Shipra and Pua, they're named. Now what's fascinating about this is that the Pharaoh is not named. People debate all the time which Pharaoh this is, but there is no debate that the midwives are named and they will be remembered for all of time while the Pharaoh is forgotten. We keep going through the story. Moses' mother, she puts him in the basket, protecting him in the ark, as you might say. Moses' sister is the one who sees from the distance and bravely approaches Pharaoh's daughter, who um, ends up adopting Moses. That's five women, most of them slave women, five women. And so it's not just that God is subverting in subtle ways the evil intentions of Pharaoh, it's also that he is using the least likely people to do it. And of course, this is what God does. He often uses the least likely people to bring salvation. I think about what Paul writes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called, when you came to faith in Christ. He says, not many of you are wise by human standards. God didn't you know, call out to you just because you had a great school. He didn't care what, what, you know, diploma you had on the wall. Not many of you were influential. So it's not because you, you came to Christ because of your connections or your great leadership ability. Not many of you are of noble birth. It doesn't, your family history is not what mattered here. But verse 27, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God did not choose to save through the Caesar, the, the ruler of the Roman Empire, but a baby born in a backwater town called Bethlehem. And he had as his disciples fishermen and a tax collector. He chose the foolish things of the world. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. The character of God is to care for the poor and the weak and the oppressed, those who suffer and who struggle, that seem to be the ones that God has a special care for, which has a couple of implications for us. One, there are some of us who will be watching today, some of us in our church who will be with us on, on, on Sunday, we feel like we're nobodies. We feel like we're forgotten. We suffer, we struggle, we feel like we're all alone and that nobody cares. Maybe we feel like we don't measure up. Maybe we feel like we've got too much baggage, too, too many failures. Others write us off and so we maybe write ourselves off. And I just want you to hear this. God does not see you like that. No, 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 you need to listen, 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 listen. You are just the kind of person God is looking to use. And because God looks for the forgotten and the nobodies and the least likely, that also means, church, that we have to have eyes to see those folks too. The church, we have to have eyes to see those who are forgotten, those who suffer and those who struggle and those who are poor and in need and those who come to church and they sit all alone and those who are never invited to come in the first place. Because while others have forgotten them, culture has forgotten them, society has forgotten them, God has not. So as we consider Moses, we learn that God is at work in all kinds of subtle and hidden ways that are hard to see, hard to perceive, and he is using people that we would never expect. But there's one more point that we have to make because the story about Moses, it isn't really about Moses, right? It's a story of salvation and it is pointing us to someone else. Someone else who was born in a time when they were killing babies someone else who was rejected by his own people, someone else who also went into the wilderness and came out declaring the kingdom of God, someone else who also received the sentence of death, but only to come and bring salvation to others. The story of Moses is not the story of this person who lived all this time ago. It's the story of salvation. It's the story of Jesus. Moses was God's chosen instrument to bring salvation to one people. Jesus is God's chosen instrument to bring salvation to all people. 
And just like the people of Israel, we, we see what salvation means and that, and that there are things that we cannot do for ourselves, but only God can come to save us. Just like the people of Israel, we too live in slavery, not slavery into to Egypt, but slavery to sin, to self, to dysfunction, to addiction. We also live in slavery and we are awaiting a deliverer to come in order to bring us freedom. Because just like the people of Israel, we need what only God can do for us. And so today, let us remember the great salvation that we have available to us, not in Moses, but in Jesus Christ, God's only son. Let's pray. And so Father, today as we begin this journey with Moses and we hear the story and we see your hand at work, first of all, we just need to confess that for some of us, we are in situations and seasons in life where it feels like things are going from bad to worse. There are some of us who, who feel like maybe you are either absent, you're uncaring or unable to save. There are people in our life that we are worried about. There are situations that we are facing that we don't have any sense of relief from. We feel overwhelmed, our soul is downcast. And so today in the, in the, in the midst of, of that darkness, Lord Jesus, we, we turn to you and we remember. Just like the people of Israel, who are slaves in Egypt, awaiting a savior, we too are awaiting only what you can do. And your work in our life, it is evident when we can look and we can have eyes to see beyond our limited perspective. But the truth is there's so many of us, we have tunnel vision just to see what we can see. Lord, would you give us eyes to see maybe in retrospect, some of the things that we've been walking through that are really your hand at work, relationships that have formed decisions we've made that have led to, 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 to different outcomes. But Lord, there's all kinds of ways that your hand has been at work leading us and guiding us towards your future for us. We thank you that in the subtle, small, hidden work of God, there is salvation doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so we give you thanks to help us to see beyond just ourselves, the great story of salvation that has been worked in our life. For anyone who's with us today and doesn't know the love of God, the salvation of God, the freedom that comes in knowing Jesus Christ, we just wanna offer up a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me our sin, or my sin and would you lead my life? It is in your name that we pray today. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today for worship. I wanna thank the team that made this service possible online and especially thank Pastor Spencer for his powerful message. If you know someone who would benefit from today's message, I invite you to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. We thank you for doing that. And now we invite you back for week two of Moses next week. Have a great week. God bless you. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? Then north and south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. And were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. From We'd hear Christ be magnified. And oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. And oh, Christ be magnified in the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. When every creature 
flies its inmost melody And every human heart is made of Christ In the world the rapture hear the praise We hear Christ be magnified Oh, Christ be magnified Puts me in the fire. I rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, oh, my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. 